thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is, my name is Alexis Lazari. I am co-chair of INCBA's student committee. Um, I'm joined by two other lovely individuals, another attorney and a current law student who will introduce themselves. Uh, we're gonna be putting on this webinar entitled, So You Wanna Be a Cannabis Attorney? Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll go ahead and, should I jump in, Alexis? Yes, please. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Marielle A. Bell. I am founding attorney of the law office of Marielle A. Bell, LLC in St. Louis. I'm an adjunct instructor at St. Louis University, where I teach cannabis law and entrepreneurship. I'm also the chair of the International Cannabis Bar Association's Ethics Committee and the incoming chair of the Bar Association of Metropolitan St. Louis's Marijuana Law Committee. Thank you, INCBA, for the opportunity to present on this important topic. And on behalf of the Ethics Committee, I would also like to thank the INCBA Students Committee for co-hosting this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, guys. My name is Callie Hoffman. I'm a graduating 3L, graduating next week. Um, I'm alongside Alexis, co-chair of the INCBA Students Committee. I'm also a board member of Students for Sensible Drug Policy and I'm an incoming associate attorney at Missouri Law, also alongside Alexis. So I'm excited to be with all of you guys today. Excellent. So a little overview. Um, our objective obviously today is to educate law students um, about cannabis law as an overarching sort of practice area and the ethical considerations uh, therein. I'm going to start off with the cannabis attorneys in practice. I'm gonna focus on the representation um, of plant touching companies um, and ancillary businesses and focus on different practice areas. Mari is going to cover the cannabis attorneys in the field and then um, ethical considerations. She's gonna focus on the ways that you can act as a cannabis attorney outside of the practice of a law firm. And again, uh, discuss some common ethical considerations. And finally, we're gonna close it with Callie who is going to discuss cannabis law as a law student and focus on how as a student you can get involved um, via our organization, the International Cannabis Bar Association, but also um, what classes you can take and active programs that you can get involved in while you're in law school. So yeah, cannabis attorneys in practice. Cannabis law is an industry group uh, that encompasses many different legal practice areas. And it's a term that also encompasses a wide range of commercial business um, activities. Cannabis law encapsulates both the state adult use and or medical marijuana laws across the country, as well as the federal hemp laws. Um, so under the 2018 Farm Bill, hemp was redefined as cannabis sativa L and all any other part, obviously you can see the definition, any part of that plant, including the seeds thereof and all derivatives, extracts, cannabinoids, isomers, acid salts, and salts of isomers with no more than 0.3% concentration of Delta 9 THC. So that uh, definition is really important as far as differentiating between what is hemp and what is marijuana, though they are the same plant. Um, this can get kind of complicated due to the federal legality of hemp and the continued illegality of marijuana in um, various states. So again, these two categories are literally an arbitrary line created from the same exact plant. Um, and it's an arbitrary, I would say, standard created by the federal government under the 2018 Farm Bill. And despite the relatedness of hemp and marijuana, these two products actually operate in two quite different regulatory schemes. Um, so cannabis operates in its own highly regulated uh, statewide scheme, wherever it is. And hemp is essentially a federally legal interstate commerce, also intrastate commerce, and it can be sold directly to consumer. <clears throat> so who needs a cannabis attorney? Um, Obviously, plant touching entities, uh, that would be everyone along the manufacturing chain. So essentially cultivators, manufacturers, distributors, testing laboratories, uh, and retailers. That includes both storefront and non-storefront. So just 
uh, a delivery um, license. So cannabis is obvious, and obviously we have ancillary businesses. Those are sort of shipping companies, software manufacturers, think like PAX um, as a software manufacturer, hardware companies, uh, security providers, banking services, um, all of those need attorneys. Um, obviously there's a distinction between uh, transactional work and sort of litigation. Obviously cannabis as an overarching element is a, it's a highly regulated sort of nascent industry. So it's advisable that nearly all operators in the cannabis manufacturing chain need a cannabis attorney, whether they have the money to hire one or the um, desire to hire one is it's another story. But um, from a transactional perspective, um, there's a lot of work to be done. <laughs> and ancillary businesses, you know, also provide an interesting aspect to the industry that people don't think about, but they're sort of complicated elements that interplay between the actual plant touching entities and the other um, companies around them. So from a litigation perspective, obviously those, there are people who can become a defendant in a suit and also plaintiffs. Um, <clears throat> this can involve internal disputes and external disputes. So there's work on both sides, obviously, transactional and litigation. Um, and oftentimes you, you need both at your disposal <laughs> if you're operating in this space. <clears throat> So now I'm going to dive into more like specifics on practice areas and <clears throat> things that you can do. Um, so corporate governance and M&A. This is um, a lot of what I actually do. Um, entity formation. So for instance, we have like entity formation filing. So to incorporate a company, um, you'll have to file documents with the state. And you'll also have to obtain like an FEIN uh, if you have employees and all of those kind of like initial filings. Um, and now there's compliance with FinCEN. There's there's a lot of initial filings that attorneys will often handle. Um, with that, you'll have to draft um, entity formation documents. This will involve negotiation skills, some contract drafting, um, in mergers and acquisitions, there's a lot of due diligence, which is um, rewarding if you enjoy that kind of uh, stuff. And um, another element of corporate governance is also a sort of the end of the life cycle of a company is uh, state receiverships. So in cannabis, they there there was a case. So I can't say that they don't have the option to a federal bankruptcy courts because there was a case. Um, but generally, they operate in the state receiverships. So having to deal with, you know, um, government agencies in this aspect is really important. Um, contract law. Uh, as a cannabis attorney, as a transactional cannabis attorney, you will likely be dra drafting contracts. Um, so again, more entity formation, corporate documents. We have LLC, LLC operating agreements versus corporate bylaws. You'll be drafting manufacturing agreements, management services agreements. Employment law is also a really important aspect of being a transactional cannabis attorney. If you're sort of serving as outside general counsel, you can find yourself drafting offer letters for new incoming um, corporate officers or highly skilled employees. Um, you'll be drafting offer letters for them, severance agreements if that um, relationship comes to an end. There's NDAs oftentimes um, when certain companies are looking to interact with each other. And even just to start a relationship, you'll want to have an NDA. And stock option agreements. So um, when you have highly skilled um, employees, you want to retain them often with stock options. So this is um, another document that attorneys will generally draft. Um, equity finance documents, uh, these can kind of include a, a plethora of things. So stock purchase agreements, voting rights agreements, investors rights agreements, right of first refusal. Um, these are all kind of under one umbrella, but basically every legal aspect 
um, of a company's business activities, I would I would advise <laughs> should be uh, reviewed and approved by the general counsel. But um, in this industry, that often is not the case. Um, people will act first and then seek their counsel. <laughs> so it's a lot um, sometimes cleanup. Um, and then um, cannabis licensing and regulatory compliance. In this industry, this can be a, a big part of your job, um, if that's sort of the role that you play. Um, this can start with license acquisitions and applications. So in depending on what market you're operating in, obviously, I'm, I'm an attorney in California, so we have a more mature market. Um, but in more nascent markets, um, you will have to write applications. Um, in order to, to get a limited license. Um, and then um, that requires communication with regulatory and administrative agencies. So lots of emails back and forth. You sort of act as a middleman between your client and the government agency. So <clears throat> um, regulatory compliance with all applicable laws. So because cannabis operates, cannabis again is an overarching uh, word that includes marijuana and hemp. So you have to consider local, state laws, and then federal laws when you're advising your clients. So it's it can be, um, yeah, a little confusing. You want to always be, make sure that, you're, that you are compliant with all, all laws. Um, and again, the distinction between hemp and marijuana, um, there are some, um, yeah, distinctions. Oops, I'm sorry, I need to be made there. And then again, for licensing and regulatory compliance, there is packaging and labeling laws that need to be adhered to and considered. And this, again, is a little more complicated when you're thinking of interstate commerce with hemp and intrastate commerce with marijuana. So interstate commerce, if you're wanting to put your product across state lines in various different states, sort of need to adhere by like the strictest state's laws, but also making sure that your product is complying with all the laws in each of the states that you're on the shelves for. And again, that uh, you'll have to think about food safety matters. Again, between marijuana and hemp, there are some distinctions because certain states uh, sort of take the stance of the FDA and the FDA at this time uh, has not made any movements on introducing hemp into food. So although it's legal, legal, um, it's, it's, you know, there are complications that you have to consider. And marketing and branding, IP considerations. This is, um, as a practitioner, can be a really interesting and important area in cannabis as well. Um, creating a unique brand um, in a sea of a bunch of products can be kind of difficult, particularly when we know that there are products in a lot of companies that use the derivative of canna, cannabis, canna green, you know, like all of these kind of sort of same, same names. So it's important to distinguish yourself um, as a brand and to protect that brand um, from the get-go. So as an IP attorney in this space, you could be working with the state trademark offices in addition to the USPTO. Um, there are copyright issues um, in times because we use the state trademark offices because of the federal Ill illegality of marijuana. Um, you're often considering different issues of, of uh, sort of regional um, first right to use, basically, in California. You know, like, did they have the marketplace in Southern California, you know, on lock? And this other company may have had, you know, the Northern California market. And you're talking about a month's span where you're distinguishing who had first use in commerce. So it can get kind of complicated, but it's exciting. Um, patents are also an uh, area that you can practice in. Um, hardware patents, software patents, cannabis cultivation patents, sort of processes that you can patent, irrigation systems. There are patents out there. Um, and again, packaging and labeling laws. Um, these are really important to consider as an IP attorney. Um, you want to make sure that you're adhering to all the different distinctions and um, yeah, requirements that each uh, state sets. And finally, as a litigator, um, as a cannabis practitioner, you can of course be a litigator. I am not a litigator. 
So, um, but you represent parties and disputes and also advocacy can be a big part of your job. Um, obviously there's plaintiff side work, there's defense work, um, business disputes. So not just being sued, but um, oftentimes there's internal corporate disputes among partners. Um, if the contract drafting didn't go well in the, initially um, and there's disputes um, between partners, you will have to deal with those. There's external disputes, obviously with third parties, employee disputes, um, issues that can arise. You'll represent them in those capacities. And um, advocacy as far as administrative agencies. Um, sometimes there are issues with uh, cannabis licensing agencies um, and a lawsuit is sort of the only way to be heard or get your point you know, across. Um, and so people, utilize that um, as an avenue as well. I would say as a litigator, it's important to focus on obviously your negotiation skills, observational skills. It's really important to be able to read people, um, communication skills, and probably being adaptable. That's, um, you know, things, uh, your life cycle revolves around the life cycle of a trial. So um, you, things don't always work your way and you need to be adaptable. But yeah, that's that's my uh, section on uh, cannabis practitioners. Um, so, Mari. I want to flag just before Mari gets going, if anyone has questions, just feel free to drop those in the Q&A and we'll address those at the end. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alexis. Hello again. Um, for my portion of today's presentation, I'll focus on attorneys in the field. So what do I mean when I say attorneys in the field? Well, well, these are just the attorneys who are involved in the cannabis industry outside of the traditional practice of law. So generally speaking, these roles do not require the attorney to represent plant touching or ancillary businesses directly. So to be very clear, I'm, I'm not suggesting that in today's presentation, an attorney could not be in practice and in the field at the same time. In fact, it's, it's very common for attorneys to handle a bit of both. However, understand that everyone's path is going to be a bit unique. Um, people have different interests. So I'm just going to highlight some different opportunities in this industry for attorneys. I'm gonna finish my portion of today's presentation by reviewing some common ethical considerations for attorneys practicing in cannabis. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the first group of attorneys in the field I, I'd like to discuss are educators. When we think of the role of an attorney, some words that come to mind are counselor and advisor. But in many ways, attorneys are also educators because we educate our clients on laws and policies all the time. So it's no surprise when attorneys embrace this skill by becoming instructors at law schools and other institutions of higher education. It's really an extension of the role that we already play in society. And it gives attorneys an opportunity to impart their specialized expertise on, on students. Now, cannabis law is no exception. So over the last decade, we have seen cannabis law programs slowly, very slowly expanding across the country um, this is a new, rapidly evolving industry, and it really just has practitioners and educators pivoting every day. So now, one, one of the neat things I'll say about practicing in cannabis education, as I mentioned earlier, I'm an adjunct instructor at St. Louis University. One of the neat things about it is, like the rest of the industry, it's completely undefined. So attorneys are teaching courses focused on various cannabis legal topics, such as cannabis policy, cannabis social reform, uh, the history of cannabis laws, and some attorneys are even leading social equity legal clinics. So there's really no cookie cutter, one size fits all cannabis law program out there. But by combining cannabis and higher education, each program really pushes the industry forward and cultivates a more informed society and builds stronger leadership, leadership in this industry. Now, attorneys are not stopping there. We are speaking at 
conferences. Um, we're legal, legal educators at industry events. Uh, attorneys are also teaching other attorneys in continuing legal education courses. INCBA, here's my shameless plug, has an annual conference called CLI that is a premier source of cannabis legal education. And we have some of the brightest legal minds in the U.S. industry and abroad speak at this conference. So if you have not heard about CLI, the Cannabis Law Institute, I highly encourage you to check it out on, on INCBA's website. Now, I'll wrap up this slide by discussing cannabis attorneys as educators in the media. And I would argue that this type of cannabis legal educator has the broadest reach because these voices for better or for worse are educating the masses. So think of traditional media outlet pundits, um, attorneys writing articles on groundbreaking cannabis legal topics and those creating cannabis focused uh, legal content on social media. All right, we can go to the next slide. And let's talk about cannabis attorneys as advocates. So I'll start by, oh, actually, hang on. Go back a second, I'm sorry. Sorry, I was like, did I skip a slide? Okay. Now? My apologies. Maybe maybe they're in a different order, but let's go to let's go to that one really fast. Okay. Sorry, I, I think I skipped your education slide. My apologies. Here's the education slide. Oh, is that what happened? <laughs> Sorry about okay. that. Here's the no, next you're slide. fine. I was just very confused. All right. So cannabis attorneys as advocates. Um, starting with lobbyists. So lobbyists are advocates, they're policy influencers and organizers. For example, many cannabis lobbyists are focusing on descheduling and rescheduling efforts, which from my news sources uh, earlier today, it seems like that's something that's really on the horizon very, very soon. So check your news about that. I haven't had an opportunity to read into it too much, so I won't speak on it, but it looks like something's going to happen with rescheduling efforts very soon. Uh, the, the lobbyists are also working on safe banking and other cannabis related issues. Uh, they're working in all levels of government. They're on Capitol Hill in DC. They're meeting with state legislators um, and they're speaking out at city halls. But we can't discuss cannabis law advocates without first discussing or without discussing social equity leaders because these are our social reform based advocates. Uh, many social equity leaders are focusing on past and, in some situations, current harms caused by the war on drugs. Um, many attorneys are already advocates in courtrooms and boardrooms across the country, so industry attorneys are using their knowledge of the law and the art of persuasion to advocate for cannabis policy reform. Now, again, to be clear, you do not have to be an attorney to be an advocate. In fact, we have so many non-attorney advocates who are doing an incredible work in this industry. But these are just some other ways attorneys are in the field and significantly impacting our cannabis laws. All right, next slide. Thank you. All right, so let's discuss cannabis attorneys as regulators. Regulators are critical. They're really critical, a critical component to this industry. Um, since cannabis is, and more specifically marijuana, ref remains uh, federally prohibited at, um, you know, it's illegal at the federal level, I should say, states are adopting and operating their own medicinal and adult use programs. So without appropriate regulations and enforcement of those regulations at the state level, these programs are jeopardized and the industry's reputation can suffer. So across the country, many attorneys are becoming state regulators in this highly regulated industry. They are overseeing licensing and compliance to ensure their state programs remain viable. These regulators are analyzing constitutional challenges under the, the dormant commerce clause. They're reviewing license applications for any signs of foul play or legal challenge. And they are defending licensing decisions in court. 
Now, attorneys are also helping create and operate social equity frameworks, which is absolutely invaluable, particularly in states where frameworks are not created by statute or initiative. As you can probably imagine, attorneys are well equipped for roles in regulatory positions because we are already trained to review and interpret laws, rules, and regulations. All right, next slide. All right, the last type of cannabis attorney in the field that I will cover for uh, today are attorneys as nonprofit leaders. Now, these are the founding board members, these are founding members, these are executive directors and organizers of nonprofit organizations. And, you know, some of these nonprofit organizations uh, include like the, the Parabola Center, the Justice Foundation, of course, INCBA, and so many other cannabis focused organizations um, across this country, many of which are led by attorneys who are using their legal training to move that organization forward. And of course, pushing for the change that so many of us uh, around the country want to see happen to our cannabis laws. Now, this is a non-exhaustive list of cannabis attorneys in the field, uh, but I certainly hope that this highlights the opportunity spectrum available for lawyers in this industry. Um, next slide. Okay, so I will wrap up today by briefly discussing some ethical considerations for attorneys considering a career in this industry, students considering a career in this industry. Um, in, in many jurisdictions, cannabis law is still considered a taboo legal practice, and its acceptance really varies by jurisdiction. So when practicing in this industry, uh, please be mindful <clears throat> of how ethical rules, pardon me, <clears throat> of how ethical rules surrounding cannabis practice are treated where you practice. Whether you're in practice or in the field, ethical rules should always remain at the forefront of your work. So the first thing I, I would highlight and suggest that you really consider doing is review the ethical rules in your jurisdiction. Um, INCBA Ethics Committee maintains a state-by-state -state database with ethical rules on the website. This is a, a great starting point, but please consult the rules of professional conduct that govern uh, your practice in, in your state. You should also, when reviewing those rules, see what disclosure requirements um, are needed. So, or I'll give you an example here. In some jurisdictions, a state rule, a rule of professional conduct, may require you to advise clients on federal prohibition, prohibition in writing. So it's not good enough just to say, oh, by the way, you know, it's legal in this state, but it's illegal at the federal level. Some states will require you to go the extra step and have that in writing. So to ensure that you are practicing in a way that is compliant with the rules of your state, uh, review those rules, comply with all disclosure requirements, and go from there. Uh, conflicts of interest. When you are working with a client, it's important that you are creating written disclosures and obtaining waivers in writing as applicable for current clients and former clients. Um, that happens in, in certain markets where an attorney might represent a client in one case and then turn around and try and represent another cannabis business in another case. You can imagine the headache that might create, especially if those businesses are in competition. So having those written disclosures and obtaining waivers as needed um, is going to be key to protecting your, your license. And the last thing I'll touch on is if you are representing a cannabis company, um, your jurisdiction likely will require you to disclose uh, personal interests that you might have in a cannabis company. So first of all, you need to confirm whether or not that's even permitted. And if it is permitted, you will want to disclose whether you have an equity interest in the company, if you sit on a board, if you hold any type of beneficial ownership 
uh, in a cannabis company, you would want to disclose that to your clients. And in most jurisdictions, you would need to put that in writing. With that being said, uh, that, that covers my portion, and I'm going to turn it over to Callie. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. This has been great so far. And I I just appreciate how thorough you guys, um, you know, covered really how much like the range of opportunity in the space is huge. And so um, I know this would have been really helpful for me when I was just getting into law school. <laughs> um, and so, well, Alexis, you can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. Um, you know, just to start, you know, as a graduating 3L, I have very much had to carve my own path in this space, like I imagine Marielle and Alexis and everyone else really in this industry has had to do. And so, it, you know, it's a really exciting and dynamic and impactful space to be a part of, but you have to work hard to identify and create opportunities for yourself in the space. Um, in my experience, you know, uh, advisors, faculty, you know, professors at school, when I would talk about wanting to get involved in drug policy and cannabis and psychedelics, you know, people would look at me a little crazy. And so, you know, there's also that kind of, you know, willingness to deviate from the norm in law school. And so I encourage you all to do that if you are, you know, really passionate about getting involved in the space. But the first obvious thing you can do is take relevant classes that will help you build the skills um, to become a cannabis attorney. And so a good place to start, obviously, if your school has a cannabis law class, that is a great way to um, get accustomed with the interaction between federal law and state law. Um, and for me, I'm based in California. And so it was a great chance to really dive into the history of cannabis policy in the state and how it has evolved in a relatively short time. And that context is really important for understanding how the industry is now working and kind of where it could go. And so I also really recommend taking classes focused on legislative and regulatory law. A lot of the rules that govern cannabis businesses are made through the regulatory process. And so understanding how that works and how to, you know, the, the system itself, the process, and, you know, how to interpret those kinds of laws is really important. And for folks that don't have any, you know, experience with the legislative process itself, I do recommend, you know, either taking classes or kind of, you know, getting familiar with what that what, what that looks like. And so, you know, the the field is very dynamic and laws are constantly changing. And so being able to, you know, track those um, those evolvements and understand how those could impact your your clients is really important. And then just really focusing on, you know, business law and classes that relate to, um, you know, the spectrum of corporate practice. I would go back into Alexis's great slides and, um, you know, kind of pull out topics, look at those and see what may be interesting and find classes that, um, that cover some of those topics. Um, and like Alexis dove into too, there's some more specialty areas within the field like IP, employment, you know, tax. Think about if you want to be a litigator versus transactional attorney. Um, and so there's a lot of, even if it's not cannabis law specific, there's so much that is very much uh, applicable to cannabis law. And so it's all about kind of finding what your interests are and then following following that path. If we can go to the next slide. And I also just want to say, too, um, kind of more generally, I'm just a big proponent on maximizing experiential learning opportunities. Um, at my school, we have great clinics and um, in-house opportunities. And so even if you can't, you know, they don't have like cannabis law firms or, you know, cannabis companies that you, you could work in-house at, there's a lot of opportunity out there that is very applicable. And so like for me, I worked in-house at a medical research company. And so, you know, being interested in psychedelics as well, like working for 
a company that is, um, you know, seeking FDA approval is was really helpful experience. And so I recommend uh, exploring those options as well. And OK, so and then two, besides taking classes, you're going to want to find a cannabis law internship if you can. And so the key to doing that is networking, networking, networking. I, you know, <clears throat> where most students, you know, will find opportunities through their schools, through things like OCI. If you want to work in the cannabis industry, you have to be a little more, um, you know, you have to go find it yourself, frankly. <laughs> and so the way to do that is by getting to know attorneys in the space who are doing the work and a great way to do that is obviously by joining INCBA. Our network is truly incredible, spans all of the United States, and we have international attorneys as well. And so we have a membership directory, this little green box if you go, if you go to the INCBA website, I definitely recommend looking at that. And also just exploring, you know, names like look who's speaking at conferences, you know, get familiar with who the, you know, big players are in the game and what you know, figure out like whose work really resonates with you and what's interesting. Um, and then request informational interviews. You know, that is how I got my first job in the space. I found, you know, an attorney who went to my, the same undergrad as me and we had a similar background. And so I was like, hey, I just sent a cold email and was like, hey, we have, you know, XYZ in common. And I would love to talk more about this. And then it turned into an offer for my 1L summer. And so I think key in those situations is, you know, I, I recommend reaching out to your career development office for, you know, if you need more kind of guidance on like how to go about doing that or just building confidence doing that, because it, it can be scary at first to just, you know, feel like you're reaching out for help, you know, basically. But, you know, people are really willing to talk to you and like if you just come with an open mind and you're not like hey give me a job um and so you know the reality is not everyone will you know say yes or reply to you but most people in my experience are so willing to talk and so I just really 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 encourage folks to be bold with doing that and you know just crank those emails out you know and leverage your network and that's how you know opportunities will arise because it's very it's kind of hard to predict and see like when openings may exist and so the key is when they do open someone will have met you or you know someone you know you'll be in people's minds and they'll be like oh yeah I met that student and they were really awesome and so I should reach out to them um, for this position and uh and yeah I would just you know you have to really be bold with doing that and so um and a great way to meet folks upcoming like marielle plugged as well the incba cannabis law institute is going to be this july in chicago unfortunately i will be taking the bar but but i definitely encourage you guys all all to make it there or to more local events um if you can okay we can move on to the next slide perfect and then lastly, you know, in addition to taking classes and finding internships, there are so many other ways that you can build your resume, experience and network and even like beyond kind of professional network, just a real community. And that's what I personally love about this industry and movement so much is that there are just so many amazing people who have become my absolute best friends, you know, through our just love for the plant and for each other. And so I really encourage you to, to, as you're carving your path, you know, follow what resonates with you and, you know, stay true to yourself and find your people. And so there's so many industry organizations out there. And so I, I included this infographic. I was just in Washington, DC for the 420 Unity Day of Action. Um, which was birthed by Last Prisoner Project and Students for Sensible Drug Policy, where I'm on the board. And so it brought together just a beautiful coalition of advocates from across the industry, attorneys and non-attorneys alike. 
And so there's so, you know, so many different groups, like whatever kind of resonates with you, there is a space for you. There's a community for you um, in this movement, you know, spanning <laughs> like minority cannabis business, indigenous cannabis business association, um, you know, it, like it goes on and on. And so I encourage you to just check out the logos on this list and familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with these organizations. And, but above all, like Students for Sensible Drug Policy was really my introdu introduction to drug policy itself and gave, you know, helped me, you know, gave me a name for kind of all of these things that I had experienced in my life and found a movement that was actively, you know, working on things that to improve those things. And so SSDP, we have, um, you know, a, a national kind of, team that spearheads our broader strategy and there are chapters at universities and law schools all across the country and so I really encourage you if your school has one definitely get involved and if they don't then start a chapter you know it's such a good way to get involved and also just create opportunity for yourself and that's you know I think a huge part of my message is that you have to be willing to create your own opportunity a lot of the times. And so, and that's very possible, you know, but you have to believe in yourself, find the right people. Um, but SSDP is a great vehicle to do that because we have so many resources where we can, you know, help you set that kind of stuff up. And our network is just, I mean, it's so strong, it's beautiful. And, you know, some, most of the, you know, folks leading on the front lines of drug policy reform are SSDP alums. And so I'm very proud <laughs> to be an SSDP -er. And so I really encourage you guys to, you know, get involved and, um, and just ask questions and build community. And I'm, I'm always here to talk to anyone if you have questions. Um, and, and yeah, I guess with, with that, we'll wrap up and get into questions if we have any. I think there's one in the chat. Oh yeah, I think I answered this question in the chat or in the, yeah, through my presentation. But if there's anything, any other specific questions, we would be happy to answer them. Maybe if we don't have questions, Marielle and Alexis, you could share a little bit about how you got involved, like what your path has looked like. Yeah, I would sort of piggyback on everything you said. Um, I took, I went to UC Hastings, which is now UC Law. What is it? University? UC Law SF. UC <laughs> Law SF. <laughs> um, I took their first cannabis law course that was ever offered in, I think, spring of 2018. And through that, I yeah, I realized the CDO at my school was kind of turned their nose up a little bit to cannabis, told me to create two different resumes, a cannabis one and a non-cannabis one, just so I didn't, you know, ruffle any feathers or shut down any job offers uh, that I may want just by nature of having that on my resume. So be prepared for some of that even still. Um, but I took that class. I actually callied the class. So, um, but then I, I leveraged that th with the professors to get a two all summer job. Um, some, the attorneys that I ended up working for came and spoke into our class and I was just blown away by how smart they were. So I reached out to them and I was like, I want a job and I want you to hire me. And they did. Um, but yeah, it's really about forging your own path. I, like Callie said, it's about networking. Um, it's really the long game, you know, people that I talked to in 2017, um, you know, gave me a job in 2021. So it's it like it, you know, and people that I now interact with on a, you know, daily or monthly basis are people that I met again when I was in law school in 2017. So it's um, and, and I also want to plug SSDP. I was when I was at Hastings, I was a president of SSDP and I utilize it as a vehicle to meet attorneys in the field, to put on panels, to put on events. It was, you know, to create opportunities for myself that weren't really there and for other students that might want to get into it. So it's a more difficult path. You know, it's not the traditional OCI situation, but uh, if you want it, there are jobs. <laughs> I'll just jump in and say, uh, as far as what Callie said about really forging your own path, that I couldn't agree with that more. Um, now, I think students are 
able to tap into resources that weren't available um, over 10 years ago when I graduated law school. But um, I think that tapping into the network that you have available now is going to be the biggest asset you can even imagine. Like I went to I went to law school in Florida. So the idea of having a, a cannabis focused organization was pretty much unheard of. Um, my introduction to this area of law came after I practiced several years as an assistant public defender and in Florida, and I was representing um, people accused of cannabis related offenses, you know, your, your traditional operators, as we call them. Um, and then I moved out west to California and I see dispensaries everywhere, you know, people are buying and, you know, not hiding it. They're walking out with their bags. And I just, I was floored because that was something completely different than I was used to living in the state of Florida and where I had just represented people for the same possession charge or, you know, for a possession charge or a distribution charge and people were distributing and possessing openly and freely in California. So um, that's where my interest was sparked. Um, becoming a member of INCBA certainly facilitated my career in this industry and, you know, tapping into the, the people in this industry, like, like Alexis and Callie have both alluded to, people are willing to talk to you because we obviously all understand the importance of cannabis education. We understand that this industry, you know, whether people like it or not, is continuing to grow. So with a growing industry, you're going to need attorneys and we need more attorneys. You know, we need people to advise these businesses so that they remain compliant and the industry continues to grow in a, in a positive direction. So that being said, I highly encourage you to, and this is not just me plugging INCBA, but I'm telling you INCBA is, is the way to go if you really are interested in this industry because you just, you can't get a better group of attorneys that are willing to help you, I think, um, unlike INCBA or other than INCBA, but there are other groups out there, just INCBA is amazing. All right. It's I don't see any other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say, I don't think we have any other questions, but I do just wanna like close in really emphasizing for folks who do end up, you know, paving a career in this path as like Marielle was just alluding to, like, for all our homies in Florida and these other conservative states like Mina Alexis and California, you know, live in kind of a little bubble. And so I just really encourage you, you know, if you're end up working, focusing on the business side of this industry, that you remember that it's a movement and that we need to bring everyone with us and that we still have people, you know, locked in jail for this plant that people are making money for. And so to you know, always keep that in mind as especially if you're working on advocacy, you know, centered centered on industry reform, make sure you always keep that in mind and you, you know, advocate for the, all of us. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this uh, webinar, we will, it will be available later for viewing. Um, we'll repost it on INCBA's channels, probably their YouTube and I don't know, LinkedIn, Instagram, if you want it, find it, contact us. Um, yeah, we're, we're always happy to talk any, any of us three. So thanks so much for joining us. This was yes. great. Better see everyone fun. at the next students committee meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Take care.